I'd like to now introduce our second speaker in this panel, uh, Professor Clinton Fernandez, who's at New South Wales, Uni of New South Wales, Canberra, at the Australian Centre for Cybersecurity. Clinton is a professor of international political studies who holds dual appointments in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences and the Centre for Cybersecurity. His research agenda is linked to the Australian Research Council's strategic priority area of securing Australia's place in a changing world, and he's the author of Island of the Coast of Asia, Instruments of Statecraft in Australian Foreign Policy. And Clinton's here today to talk to us about Timor Leste. Thank you, Professor Paul, for inviting me to the opportunity to be here. Uh, I've been asked to speak about the last uh, 12 months in Timor. Uh, I was certainly going to do it, but I want to uh, mention three factors that condition whatever happens in the last 12 months, or three background factors. Uh, the first one uh, is the continuing effect uh, of a 24 year uh, war of independence uh, uh, Timor against Indonesia. Uh, it resulted in uh, two things. Uh, one is the moral authority of uh, the guerrilla warriors who were uh, uh, members of the resistance, the clandestine resistance um, in, in the towns. Um, and that remains in force, um, no matter what else uh, is going on. The second uh, legacy of that, due to a very high death toll in the late 1970s, um, is an extremely young population. Um, and so uh, uh, their interests and their identities are still in the process of being formed. Uh, people who were born uh, when Timor was a Portuguese colony have a particular understanding of what it means to be Timorese, but then we were part of the Lucifer world. Uh, people who were born during the Indonesian occupation also have a particular understanding of, of what it means to be Timorese. Um, and for them, Indonesian is not uh, a foreign language. Uh, it is the language in which they were educated. Um, and people who were born after the departure of Indonesia, or were very young in Indonesia, have a different understanding of what it means to be Timorese. Um, and so uh, party loyalties, and whatever I'm going to talk about in the next um, uh, well, uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, will be uh, conditioned by those factors, uh, the moral authority of people in resistance, uh, the young population, and what that means for conceptions of national identity, party loyalty, and so on. And the third factor, which is not unrelated to the, uh, uh, the invasion of Timor in the first place, uh, is the importance of oil in the uh, by natural gas uh, to the Timorese economy. Uh, it is the second most uh, oil dependent country in the world after San Sudan. That's it. Um, the update is that uh, there has been uh, a period of confrontation and political stable uh, which continues uh, at least. And that is because uh, of uh, a rivalry uh, between uh, major parties who are. Uh, led by very powerful figures uh, who, as I said, enjoy the moral authority and are associated with uh, the resistance. Uh, the major figures um, are uh, Shimano Gusmao on the left, um, who's uh, about to be 75 years old, uh, in the mountains and towns as a guerrilla for uh, about 16, 17 years before uh, uh, being imprisoned, um, and is um, the most important single person the most important, most influential single person in Timor. Uh, the gentleman in the middle um, is uh, Maria Katiri, uh, former Prime Minister, uh, and uh, uh, he was not in Timor during the occupation. Uh, he was in uh, Mozambique and other places. Um, and the third person is uh, Tao Matangrua, uh, his real name is uh, uh, Jose Maria Vasconcelos. Uh, Tao Matangrua means uh, two extra sharp eyes. It's, uh, um, and so these are the three key personalities. And the fourth is uh, the current president of the Republic. Now, um, his name is uh, Francisco Guterres, of his uh, non non as we know. Um, and in March 2017, uh, he won the presidential elections uh, with uh, a, a single majority of the vote, 57% of the vote. Now, his victory is the legacy of an earlier period, the two previous years, of cross-party unity, in which um, uh, parties that were in opposition to him decided to back him and support him um, for the presidential bid. And that period from 2015 to 2017 was called a period of national exclusion, um, uh, a period of unprecedented political unity. Uh, but it's a period that has never sat well with members of the 
international parliamentarians and the international community based in the capital. Because for them, uh, they kept saying, well, where's the opposition? If in 2015 and 2017, you've got uh, the major parties united in the grand bargain, they all agree to share power. It's very good for unity, but it doesn't match uh, the conventional Western liberal democratic uh, uh, sense of uh, uh, institutionalized competition uh, with multi party uh, you know, democracy and there's an opposition. And so, for that period, uh, it was always asking, well, you know, who's the opposition? Where's the opposition? But what it did deliver. Uh, was uh, cross-party unity and a period of uh, harmony in the national parliament. Um, and yes, there was also a lack of scrutiny of certain major projects, because people were compromising as to what we should expect. Um, some months later, uh, Fredman, uh, which is the party to which this particular gentleman belongs, uh, narrowly won the parliamentary elections. And um, there was really only less than a thousand or about a thousand seats, uh, a thousand votes. Uh, in the difference between the Threaten Party, which is a real party, it has party meetings, it has branches, and so on, and the other parties, many of which are really personalities, which are uh, which have members and so on, but it's really personalities right now. Uh, and the National Congress for Timorese Reconstruction, uh, which was the party of uh, Sharan Kishma, uh, won 29.5 percent of the votes, and there's just about a thousand votes in it. Uh, the People's Liberation Party, uh, which was formed when the person on the right, uh, Tarawa Tangrua, uh, left the resigned from the presidency and uh, uh, led the party, the People's Liberation Party, uh, as about well eight seats. And that was uh, uh, that party was uh, benefits from um, the presence of uh, some people who have been trained to a very high level and uh, uh, the uh, younger people, the member of the newer generation, um, and uh, some of them had PhDs, including from the Australian National University um, and other universities. Um, and uh, they were, there was a natural kind of harmony between them and people in the international community in Dili. And as a result, um, uh, there was a sort of stylized uh, 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 liking of, of their potential, uh, which certainly is there. And then there's the Democratic Party and a new party, a youth party uh, called Koto, uh, enriching the national unity of the sons of Timor. Uh, now, these parties, uh, especially the latter ones, uh, reflect this newer generation of, of Timorese uh, who were born when Indonesia left, or just before Indonesia left, uh, and their identities are still being formed. Um, in the last election, 20% uh, of the voters had voted for the first time. That is very high. By comparison, in tomorrow's Australian federal election, 4% uh, of the voters are voting for the first time. So 20% is a very, very large figure, which means that in a year's time, um, uh, you know, there's an update on Timor in a year's time, you might find some more dynamics as people uh, begin to develop uh, part of unity and loyalty and sense of identity. This is the action of uh, So that is the, uh, that is the uh, uh, state of play in the National Parliament. Uh, you know, it's a unicameral parliament, which is one of our house. Um, and uh, 65 seats, uh, Fredman was neck and neck. Uh, with uh, the National Congress of uh, Timorese Reconstruction. Um, and uh, there was some expectation uh, that uh, there would be uh, a power sharing agreement, some kind of uh, division of the spoils, some of the plum jobs, some of the well, influential positions uh, would be shared between some of the winners. Um, and so uh, that's the, uh, uh, the end of the period of national unity because uh, there was disagreement as to who would get what job. Uh, the uh, Fretton Party wanted to have uh, uh, the president of the national parliament, like the speaker of uh, one of our houses, um, in, uh, in that role. We wanted its member to be in that role. Uh, well, the other party said we've already got the president of the republic uh, who was a president of the uh, And how can you have uh, the president of the parliament as well as a, as a president member? And then the prime minister of the parliament uh, has also got to be a federal member, but we can't have that. We, we have to have some kind of compromise and power sharing. Uh, and uh, there was a disagreement about that. And the result was that, you see from the, uh, the uh, uh, seat uh, distribution, uh, that Fretton did not enjoy a majority of its own right. And so the other parties decided to group together and simply block legislation uh, that Fretton was advancing into the parliament. And uh, it was unable to force this legislation. Had it passed, had it presented its budget for a second time 
and had, and, uh, had it been rejected. Uh, on constitutional grounds, it would have been out of office. And so what uh, Kremlin did was, because uh, the, the, their uh, member was the Speaker of the National Parliament, simply refused to convene the Parliament. Uh, there, was no, there was no next session of uh, Parliament. Uh, as a result, um, uh, the President of the Republic uh, dissolved uh, Parliament uh, early in Jan. Okay, so that is the context. Uh, it's very, very live issues today, uh, because the only solution that the, the President of the Republic had was, well, let's have uh, a new election. Okay, so a new election was called in May 2018. And uh, the National Congress of Cumulative Reconstruction combined with uh, the parties that had previously competed against uh, to form the Alliance of Change and Progress. Um, uh, that is an English version of uh, the initials A and P, which are the uh, previous, uh, the, uh, previous initials of the Alliance of the uh, Majority in Parliament. So these are uh, these are acronyms and, and, and names uh, that are that are uh, signifying some of the things in T. Uh, signifies Shimana, A and P signifies not Fretel, for example. Um, and so Fratel uh, displayed impressive uh, campaigning and party discipline in the May 2018 election and, and held on to a straight three seats, but it's typically to compete against the combined forces of, uh, of the Alliance for Change and Progress. Um, and there were other uh, parties like the Democratic Party, and there were three smaller parties which combined into the Democratic Party. Uh, there is something uh, very interesting and unique about, uh, uh, about uh, the parliamentary system in Tibor. Um, running for parliament is like running for the Senate in a state. Okay? The party will advance a series of candidates, and the state as a whole is the electorate. So in, in, in the parliament in Timor, uh, there are party lists, and the entire, the entire country is the electorate. Uh, there is no such thing as a member for, say, Los Paz. I mean, you might be from Los Paz, but that doesn't mean there's no such thing as in any particular place. Uh, and by law, uh, every third person on the party list has to be female. Uh, and so what that means is that it gives it a very high proportion of uh, female representation um, inside the team of um, And that has consequences uh, in terms of real models, confidences. Okay, so that was the parliamentary makeup after the, um, uh, after the, the, the 2018 elections. And you see here, Fretton is uh, in the minority, you've got the Alliance of Change and Progress. But what the uh, other parties lack is a supermajority, which allows them to change things like the diplomacy. And I'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so that's the part of the thing that I've met. Uh, I want to see you can see the difference. Uh, Fretton more or less to make, retains uh, its seats, uh, whereas uh, uh, the CNRT people and, and, and the other alliances have uh, not. The um, uh, other feature of the Timorese political system is it's a semi presidential system. Uh, we're familiar with parliamentary systems, uh, which is what we've got here. You have a governor general who is uh, the representative of the Queen, but is essentially a you know, figurehead role, uh, has certain reserve powers, but really doesn't need to be, and acts on the advice of uh, the Federal Executive Council, the Prime Minister, and so on. And you have a presidential system where the, uh, the President of the Republic, like you see in the United States, uh, simply appoints members of the uh, of cabinet uh, and they aren't in Congress. Well, Timor has a semi preservation system. It's the only company in Southeast Asia to have one. There are very few countries in Asia um, that have uh, semi preservation systems. I think it's Kyrgyzstan and maybe Taiwan and Sri Lanka. Uh, but apart from that, uh, Timor is the only one in Southeast Asia. So, what's a semi preservation system? It means that the President of the Republic is directly elected in a separate election. Uh, to the parliamentary election. Okay, so all voters have the, have the chance to vote for a single person as the president of the republic. And that gives uh, a gentleman the right, the role, uh, or whoever becomes president, uh, a political authority uh, because the public has voted for him. Uh, the prime minister, on the other hand, is simply the person, not simply, but is the person uh, who can command a majority of votes in the national parliament. Uh, so the president has personal authority. Um, and uh, because Timor is a new country, it's only been independent since 2002, uh, there aren't any conventions that have crystallized. There are conventions. Uh, in Australia, for example, we know that the 
Constitution does not say what it means, and it doesn't mean what it says, because there are conventions. Uh, well, Timor as a new country is beginning to develop its own conventions, so it's not exactly clear what powers are really conventions that the President of the Republic uh, has to exercise on the advice of the Prime Minister, and what powers the President of the Republic can just simply exercise in his or what. Uh, so that's a semi-presidential system, and what it means is that it gives the President, whoever the President is, uh, the uh, authority uh, should he choose to exercise the powers that are in the Constitution, um, <clears throat> using the authority to intervene in politics directly from time to time. And what he's done is so that's, that's a, an outline, a diagram of Timur's parliament, which is uh, Timur's uh, uh, government. Uh, the box at the top is actually the prime minister, so the president sits outside that. You select the um, He rejected. Uh, nine ministerial appointees, or none of these, um, that have been advanced uh, by uh, uh, the government, uh, citing the uh, poor moral standing and the fact that some of them uh, might have been under uh, under uh, investigation, potential investigation. Um, and uh, as a result, uh, there are these vacancies. Uh, not all ministries are actually filled uh, in Parliament. Uh, and the President does actually have the right to reject uh, nominees, that is in the Constitution, and I guess by, by exercising the right, uh, he's helping to define uh, the, the conventions. Uh, the other uh, <coughs> issue uh, in the last uh, 12 months uh, is this very large petroleum sector, Timor Leste, as I said, is the second most petroleum dependent uh, country in the world, um, but um, it has a, a diminishing oil and gas income. Uh, much of the uh, areas uh, where the liquefied natural gas uh, that's under the waters of the Timor Sea uh, uh, have actually been explored uh, by geoscientists for many decades. Uh, there aren't that much, there isn't that much oil left. It's not Kuwait, it's not Brunei. Uh, but there appears to be a kind of cargo cult mentality developing. Uh, developed, not developed, it's there. Government saying, well, you know, we can just keep up, we can just keep pumping out the oil and you'll be fine. And this is what needs to be resource based, which means it is uh, easier to neglect uh, national infrastructure, hospitals, and so on, and schools. Uh, because if you're in the elite, you can simply fly to Singapore or Melbourne somewhere and get uh, surgery that's not available uh, in Timor. And Timor absolutely is, uh, is, uh, is uh, in that resource space. Uh, the, uh, 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 the other aspect of this uh, economic trade is uh, problem with resource space. Uh, is that they have a program fund. All the money that was coming out from the oil contracts uh, was going to go into, had gone into a fund, into a, and the interest on that fund, uh, which is an account of the year, the interest on that, minus the inflation and so on, would be the national budget. So that would preserve, uh, the, was supposed to protect against the resource base that was uh, uh, developed after the advice from the original advisors. Um, and so what they've done is. Uh, uh, they try to withdraw more and more money from the petroleum fund itself. And if it, spending continues as uh, along current lines, there will be no money in the petroleum fund, which means there will be no money anywhere else by 2030. Okay? It'll be broke. There is no more money there. There's no other source of income. Uh, it doesn't generate anything else, like uh, you know, maybe some coffee and things like that. And so you see that. Make, uh, uh, a major effort then has gone into finding a new source of petroleum income, which is the oil and gas on the Timor Sea, and they want to uh, pipe uh, uh, the oil, the, the, the gas, uh, from where it's supposed to be, in the great sunrise, it's going to be the show, uh, into the south coast of Timor, and build a major petrochemical refinery and so on, and an entire industry on the south coast. Uh, as a result of which, now agriculture, uh, sorry, health, education, um, uh, receive um, less than or about 15 percent of the federal budget, of the national budget, uh, whereas infrastructure receives more than 50 percent, and uh, that has huge consequences because of this demographic factor. Uh, half the population is over the age of 17; the other half is, of course, above the age of 17. Uh, and so, uh, what is this going to do when you've neglected building the schools, investing in, in education, health? Um, uh, down the road, and not too far down the road, uh, this is going to have problems uh, with crime, uh, with unemployment, with unrest, uh, and it's a failure to invest in, uh, in, in the country's future, with huge uh, policy implications. And with that uh, is the final factor 
of uh, this update, the future of Greater Sunrise. Uh, there is, in fact, a lot of a lot of uh, yes, not pure, but there is some yes uh, on the top right. Greater Sunrise which straddles both the Australian and the uh, Timorese uh, uh, maritime borders. Um, it's expected. Uh, some people say that 50 million dollars worth, US dollars worth of gas, will eventually come out of there. Uh, it's hard to know what to say about such estimates, frankly, uh, because the price of gas uh, is always dropping now. Uh, there is a, a, there's a, a glut of gas uh, on, on the market. So all these estimates are, are extremely imprecise. Uh, but the team of leadership, at least the people in the have given their hopes uh, to greater sunrise in order to deliver a win for them. Um, and uh, if not, uh, well, there'll be something more than that over the next few weeks. Okay, that's all I have. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, just wait for the mic. We'll take one down the front. Oh, just five right here. Thanks. Uh, Professor, uh, in terms of uh, promising Israel's uh, strategic development plan, mm -hmm. which was um, launched some uh, five, six years ago, the team over here in Sydney as well, much before. In terms of trying to adjust to some of the anomalies which you raised, Obviously, it's legitimate. How's, how's the implementation of that progressing in terms of trying to cut balance? The plan is progressing because the, the budget, in fact, is the financial expression of that national development plan, uh, or strategic development plan part. Right? Uh, now, of course, I'm speaking with a certain degree of simplification because not everything gets fast. Uh, but, the, but they do call for a large amount of, of infrastructure investment. But they also say our number one priority, well, not exaggerating, is um, agriculture, health, uh, and education. Okay, because it means you have to say that in order to keep the budget happy. Uh, but agriculture, which employs 70% of the population, except they're not counted in the figures because subsistence farming is not considered a job. 70% uh, of the people are in agriculture, it receives 2% of the budget. Uh, health and education combined receive 15% of the budget. Uh, and so uh, the, the plan is, is one that calls for infrastructure. Uh, but it also calls for investment in these other things. And uh, like I said, they are, they are neglecting it because of the resource costs. And now they've pinned the entire hopes to great summaries. So we'll take a question there, and then there's one for you, Ariel. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, in Australia, a lot of the coverage of TMLS is sort of centered around that maritime dispute. Um, how successful has um, TMLS been in terms of its foreign policy strategy in the region more broadly? The region will, okay, well, it's number one priority in foreign policy, apart from trying to uh, uh, settle the maritime borders of Australia, has been to get into ASEAN. Okay, that, that is the second priority, uh, and now the maritime border seems to have been solved. Uh, it's the second priority. Um, and they've been trying for many years to get into ASEAN. They enjoy the support, uh, political support inside ASEAN of Indonesia, which uh, lobbies to get them into ASEAN. Uh, but uh, they have so far been unable to get into ASEAN. Uh, Precisely why uh, it has to do with uh, certain countries' uh, wishes that it will uh, improve its own uh, economy, its education, and other things before they get into ASEAN, because otherwise it will simply bring uh, uh, a state that is extremely weak into ASEAN. Uh, but that is, that's the number one priority now that Maritime Dispute has been But just a footnote on that, oh. it was interesting when I was interviewing business people in Timor that many of those didn't want to go into ASEAN because no. they knew they wouldn't be able to compete. Mm -hmm. So it's quite a complicated issue. Thank you for the marvellous presentation. I just wanted to know um, what your thoughts are about um, what the PLP thinks about buying this big stake in, in oil, uh, is it an oil company, right? Uh, and whether or not there was any dissatisfaction in that coalition with Bushman's leadership or whether or not everyone was on board with that kind of... Okay, so the PLP, just to, to, to remind you all, is um, the People's Liberation Party, which is the party of the young technocrats, led by uh, the uh, current Prime Minister, Talma Tanua. Uh, his big criticism was actually of uh, the Shanana Guzmao led uh, massive spending, and he, uh, he uh, uh, refused to pass uh, legislation, in fact, blocking uh, certain aspects of the budget, but he was president of the Republic. Now, uh, uh, so his expressed uh, views were highly critical. Having been brought into this coalition, he is now talking about, I'm, I'm not, I'm not caricaturing here, that uh, it's, uh, we have independence or death when we're fighting uh, for, for, for 
independence, and anybody who's not doesn't have the daring or the guts to uh, uh, to spend and to, and to invest in, in this uh, Sunrise project, uh, you know, doesn't uh, well, it's, it's wrong. Let's say, right? um, now, I can say, let, let's take the best possible defense of this position, the best possible defense. It is that there is something else in those uh, in, in the sea that is being secretly, uh, that they know about secretly, some other resource in there, uh, which, is, which is why Australia, which is an advanced industrial state, uh, with great geoscience resources, has been holding on so, so long to try and prevent uh, Timor getting access to the sunrise, it's getting on hope for so long. Uh, that's the best possible defense I can think of for, for that position, that there is something else uh, under the waters, uh, some other undisclosed resource, uh, which is, and then now that Talmud al has been brought into the Shanana camp, uh, he's been given a classified briefing as to what this thing is. He said, that's one thing. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not saying this uh, uh, in any way as a, as a joke. I mean, it's, it's quite possible. It's quite possible that these are matters of state. Um, and which is why, you know, Australia has also been treating these team quite, quite brutally at times. With it. You know, there might be something else in there. Um, Second, and that's not lucky, you're not even gas, it might be not a little point, actually gas, it might be something else. It's not. The second thing is, he's sitting through his party line because he's now the Prime Minister. Okay. Uh, I'm not prepared to, set to, uh, to dismiss uh, option one. Okay. Earlier in the, in the talk, you talked about the three generations that were of the, the colonials, one of the, you know, the Portuguese and Indonesians, and then, uh, and then today. Yes. How big a drag on the development of East Timor will be this, what, what strikes me as an extraordinary sentimental thing about the Portuguese language being a language in, in, in uh, because it seems to me the PLP people don't seem to have any real affection for that. Yes. And a lot of the people you speak to who have been educated in Australia and even those who spent some time in Portugal think that it's quite unrealistic to expect that it seems less they can go on and, uh, with Portuguese is an official language, but everybody, after all, speaks Bahasa or Indonesian, uh, apart from Tenet, and most people speak English. Yeah, look, I, um, uh, the, the census results is what I'm relying on, and the, uh, the, the uptake of Tetra has actually increased phenomenally between the 2010 census and the 2015 uh, census. There's actually a high, high penetration, even in the eastern part. Uh, which is, you know, Makasai, uh, Makalero, other people. Yes, they still speak those languages, but the prevalence of Tetum take up has actually increased. I have to say that. Uh, secondly, uh, at the elite level, Portuguese is, in fact, uh, the language of uh, business uh, to a certain extent. And the justification that's given, that's the private justifications, are that it is fundamental to our identity as a loser for country. Uh, I'm speaking I'm about them, I'm not too pleased. Right? Uh, that um, uh, we are otherwise what makes us unique about uh, about being Timorese. I mean, you could just why are we just the same as West Timorese, right? And so, to a certain extent, that that Lusophone, the sense of belonging to a membership of the community of Portuguese language uh, speaking people, um, is part of the Timorese identity. Uh, but there's no question uh, that the, the, the generation that led the resistance, uh, which was uh, conversant in Portuguese. Uh, would not want to have Indonesian as the language, and this is, I mean, this is just, there's, you can't just get out of it, right? You have, have these kinds of things, uh, it, is, it is quite common in societies that have such a vast disparity of experiences in their lives. I, I don't know what's going to happen in the future, whether they'll be going to Indonesia or stay with Portuguese. I suspect there's enough institutional weight for Portuguese, simply because of what it means to be in, the, in their identity. Someone has one last great question. Okay, if not, please help me.